going to tell you only about his most recent impressive contributions. Uh, they say here in Washington that OIRA, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, is the most important office that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, OIRA itself is housed within OMB, uh, and as director of the Office of Management and Budget, overseeing OIRA is but a fraction of Mr. Mulvaney's responsibilities. Uh, in addition to heading OMB, for some significant period of time, he also served as the acting head of the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, one of the most controversial agencies in the federal government and consequently one of the most difficult to lead. And he has served as acting White House Chief of Staff since January of this year. He's also whip smart and known for his high level of energy. And one of my favorite observations I've heard from Ms. Mick Mulvaney is a simple yet important insight, just simple numeracy, the ability to understand and work with numbers about the GDP, uh, the, the gross domestic product, he compares 2% GDP and 3% GDP. And it sounds like a slight gain if you, if you just gloss over that, but he notes that 3% GDP is not a mere 1% better than 2%. No, 3% GDP is 50% more than 2% GDP, an enormous gain when you stop and think about it. Uh, so I look forward to hearing his insights today. Mr. Mulvaney. Thank you. By the way, that, um, the, the story about GDP is actually true. That, that's, a, that's a real conversation I had with my dear friend Trey Gowdy. Um, I was trying to explain to him uh, about the economy, because it's numbers, and Trey's not good with those. Um, and he was the one who said, what's the big deal? It's only 1%. I'm like, this is why we don't let you do budgets. You're on TV talking about the law, because he's really, really good at that. Um, they've asked me to, to, uh, to deliver some formal comments uh, today before I take the q and I don't like delivering formal comments, uh, honestly, mostly because I'm not very good at it. It requires me to tell a joke uh, at the beginning. <clears throat> and I've learned, um, and as folks who, there's, I think there's a couple of folks in this audience who've worked for me, is Blankenstein here someplace? One of my favorite lawyers ever at CFPB. They, they know I don't have a sense of humor. I'm a budget person. Yeah, so I don't tell jokes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to steal a joke for someone else and explain to you why I don't do jokes. Um, it's Mitt Romney's joke. He helped me in 2010. And we were doing a fundraiser as I was running for Congress. We're backstage. I'm like, look, Mitt, I don't know how you do this. You're so good at public speaking, and I'm terrible. I mean, you always seem witty. You always seem quick. I mean, you always, you know, you got a great sense of humor. He goes, oh, what, you like my jokes? I'm like, yeah, I do. He goes, what, what joke do you remember? Of course, you never remember jokes, right? I actually remembered one. <clears throat> and I said, well, the joke you told about how you were talking to your wife uh, late one night in bed uh, during the campaign, and you turned to her and you said, sweetie, did you ever in your wildest dreams think that we'd be running for president? And she turned back to me and she said, Mitt, sweetheart, you're not in my wildest dreams, okay? So that's, that's the story. It's a really good, it's a good joke. It's a great one. Um, and I told him, I said, that's a great joke. He goes, oh, you like that one? I said, yeah, I did. He goes, you like that? I said, yeah. He said, that cost me $30,000. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? He said, yeah, no, we hired a comedian to go with us on the, on the, uh, on the tour. So we always had topical stuff from a particular town. Like, this is why I'll never run for president. I'm too cheap to pay people to do that. Um, so they want me to talk a little bit about uh, DREG, which is one of my favorite things. So I'll talk for a few minutes about that. We'll talk a little bit about um, the balance of power in Washington, D.C. Talk two seconds about the economy, then we'll take questions. Um, DREG, uh, and uh, to say it's a priority for the administration, I can prove to you it's a, it's, it's a, a priority of the administration because I'm leaving here. The reason I, I do have to leave on time is that we have a cabinet meeting this morning. And the first thing on the agenda is going to be uh, what the various agencies are doing to help deregulate um, the economy. It is a constant theme. In fact, the very first cabinet meeting I was at as the uh, acting chief of staff is I came in and said, look, um, I'm new. You guys know me from OMB. I've talked to the president about what he wants out of the cabinet. We're going to do a couple things. First and foremost, you're going to be judged based upon how much you can deregulate. That's it. If, if you want to, be, if you want to have, be successful in this president's eyes, come in and show him what you're doing to get rid of all the crap that previous administrations has, have layered on this economy. Get us a way to, to help us. This is your part. Even if you're at the Department of Agriculture or EPA or whatever, this is your contribution to getting us to 3% economic growth on a sustained basis. So do it. Um, and they've got that message. They come in out of my office once or twice a, a year, just about every, every other quarter to go over what they're doing. I'll talk a little bit about what's happening there, uh, but it's absolutely a priority. Um, and the president uh, even goes so far as he's getting regular briefings now on uh, the deregulatory agenda from OIRA, which works uh, on my old, I don't run OMB anymore, Russ Vogt does, a tremendously capable guy. But I don't know if you all know Paul Ray. Paul might actually be in the room, um, but Paul's a Hillsdale grad, a Harvard Law School grad. He's about as geeky as you can get. And this is the guy who's the acting director of OIRA now that Naomi is on the, uh, Naomi Rao got put on the, the DC circuit. 
market. And so Paul, in his very first trip into the Oval Office last week, I'm not making this up, I'm gonna tell this story forever. He goes in to brief the president on the update, the deregulatory agenda to prepare for the cabinet meeting. And he goes through all the stuff, and it's very, very dry, by the way, for if you've never been through deregulatory stuff, it's not the most scintillating material. But interestingly, if you come to talk to the president on most, uh, uh, 99 times out of 100, it's, it's boom, 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 it's back and forth. It's a very sort of energetic conversation. He's, he's engaging you, he's talking to you, or moving around the room, you know, you get your couple minutes and boom, he's, you know, he's, it's questions to you, he's interrupting you, you're interrupting him, it's a, it's a free-flowing conversation. Paul talked for him like seven minutes straight and the president never said a word. I've only seen that like once or twice since I've been there. And at the end of Paul's sort of presentation, the president leaned back and said, you love this job, don't you? <laughs> and Paul said, yeah, yes I do. He goes, no, no, for you, for you, this is the perfect job. This is the job you've always wanted in your entire life. <laughs> and Paul said, yes, I think it does. And then the president took it another, to another direction. He goes, so, would you rather be you doing this, or would you rather be, say, Tiger Woods from 10 years? Not Tiger Woods from last week, not, but Tiger Woods <laughs> from 10 years ago when he was winning all of the tournaments and, and he was on the top of the world, he's number one. Would, would you rather be him or you? And Paul Ray, and I am not making this up, the, 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 the most boring guy you ever gonna meet looked right at the president and said, Mr. President, once we achieve all of these things that I have on this piece of paper, Tiger Woods is gonna wanna be me. <laughs> I, I just... I, I, can't, I can't do any better. I, I'm surprised you didn't offer him the chief of staff job right there. So um, it's paying off. The, the commitment that we've had is paying off. And I know I'm on open press here, so I have to, I'm going to refer to some, some numbers so I don't screw them up. But uh, it, uh, the proof is in the pudding. When we first got here, the president said, look, I want, a, I want two for one, and I want zero dollars. What does that mean? Everything you get, any, every new reg you want to put on, um, you, you have to get rid of two. And net, of all the ins and the outs, you cannot increase the dollar burden. So even if you get rid of six and you want to put back on one, you can't do it if the one costs more money than the six that you got rid of saved, okay? It's been a tremendous success. Uh, even at the most conservative measure, we're doing four to one, and that's on the big heavy-duty ones. If you want to just talk about regs across the board, I think as of last count, uh, which was October, we're getting ready to update this in the next couple of weeks, it was 12 to one. So all things told, every time we've put a new reg on in the first two and a half years of administration, we've gotten rid of 12 old ones. Um, the numbers are just astounding. It's almost, I think, 2,000 regs that we've cleared off right now. One of my favorite stories of deals my first couple of weeks at OMB when I was talking to the, the career staff about the DREG agenda. And, you know, we, there was there's not pushback, but it was just, we, we haven't done it for a long time. So it's a, it's a muscle memory thing. We haven't really deregulated in a long time. In fact, I remember stories about uh, some agencies not having people who had ever done it before and some agencies not having a, a, a piece of paper to start a deregulatory action versus regulatory action. But I remember talking to OMB because I knew they ran OIRA and I said, look, what can we do to help these agencies? And, the, and one of the answers from the OMB career staff, who I adore to death, these are the hardest working, committed uh, bureaucrats, and I don't say that negatively, they work as hard for President Trump as they did for President Obama, and they said, well, you could start by looking at the secret list, and that wasn't the official term of it, but that's what they called it, and I said, well, I've never heard of that. And they said, yes, it worked, didn't it? Um, <laughs> Uh, apparently, several years into the Obama administration, um, they realized they had not been doing enough to sort of satisfy their left wing. So they, they started talking about regs to sort of satisfy that extreme faction in their party, but they also realized they had to go through a re-elect re in 2012 and didn't want to really be too public about it. So what they did is they told the lefts, look, we're going to do this, but we're going to leave it over here on this, I can't, pending list, we'll call it the secret list, um, and we're not going to make it public, we are working on it. And they won re-election, it worked so, worked so well, they left it on there and they kept adding to it. And that list was over 700 regs by the time we took over. Um, and once we exposed that to the sunshine in the first couple of months of this administration, all of those went away. Um, and by the way, we don't have a secret list anymore. We're not doing that. That's not how government should function. Um, so thanks, yeah. Um, the, um, the, uh, the cost savings has been tremendous. I think uh, as of October last year, we're saving about $33 billion on a net present value basis in terms of what we've done. All of the deregulatory action has taken that level of burden off of, in, in most cases, the private sector. Uh, so it is absolutely working and it's gonna continue to work. I'll go down the list of what's what we're working on right now. Um, we're going into our, our second NPRM on opportunity zones. If you don't know what that is, you're missing the biggest piece of the tax bill. 
Um, this is the, the it was uh, Tim Scott's initiative. Uh, we worked, he worked with President Trump on this. The president has, has absolutely bought into it whole hog. And this is the, uh, the change in the tax laws that allows you to grow assets inside certain economically depressed areas tax free. Uh, it could be one of the most dramatic and dynamic things that we've done in the tax code in a very, very long time. I was just out at the Milken Institute uh, a seminar in California. I lose track of the time, but they did entire segments on just that. Uh, we've already seen 8%, 8% wage growth in opportunity zones in the first six months that these things have been in place. You're seeing home values rise in areas that are traditionally uh, areas that were poor families own their homes. They've owned them for a long time, uh, and they're seeing increases in their, in their equity in their homes, which is going to unlock tremendous amounts of capital uh, for them, which is a, just a tremendous um, opportunity that we have, for lack of a better word. Um, the CAFE um, comment period has closed. We're working on that. By the way, the proposed, um, the estimated range of savings on just the CAFE standards is between 120 and $240 billion. DOL is working on um, three big ones, the joint employer rule, the overtime rule, the regular rate, um, and Interior is working on uh, trying to figure out a way to fix the endangered species protection so that it, do, it no longer appears. One of my favorite stories about the Endangered Species Act was we had a, a bat uh, down where I live in South Carolina, and the bat had, 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 had contracted an infection. The infection was brought over from overseas, I think it was from Africa, and the bat was dying out at, at, at a very aggressive rate because of this invasive disease. And because it ended up being um, either threatened or endangered, I can't remember what the status was, you couldn't cut down any trees in its habitat area which makes absolutely no sense. The lack of trees, the lack of nesting area was not the reason that the thing was endangered. It was the, the illness from overseas, but the penalty on private industry and on private landowners and on private business was to take away large portions of their economy and in certain, say, certain circumstances, people's ability to make a living. Um, it's a completely nonsensical sort of outcome and we're trying to reduce those. Um, so that will continue. It is an absolute um, priority for the administration and I think our words, excuse me, our actions there speak even louder than our words. It is, a, it is something that we will continue to push. Um, we'll push there because uh, the balance of power in Washington really is screwed up. Um, and I'll talk about that very briefly, then I'll be quiet and take your questions. Um, I gave a speech, I gave the, uh, the Imprimus speech at uh, Hillsdale and talked about how the executive branch of government doesn't have enough power. And I got a stunned response, as you can Prob probably imagine, especially from that group and probably from this group, but here's the, here's the lay of the land. Um, things are completely out of whack here. Why? Because we have too much authority where we shouldn't have it and not enough authority where we should. Why have we been able to be so successful in our deregulatory efforts? Because Congress has given us all of this authority, okay? Because they don't want to do the work. I mean, go through just the Affordable Care Act, and I can't remember how many thousands of times it says the secretary shall, the secretary shall, the secretary shall, because they're just too lazy to make law. And they give it to the full-time bureaucrats, so they, and I say this as someone who used to do this, can go home every weekend and every other week. I mean, that's just, they, they don't take the time to legislate. They give us the authority. That's wrong. At the same time, the power they keep from themselves and deprive us of is just as wrong, and that's the ability to run the government. Can I tell you the number of times we've wanted to do something as the chief executive, the president as a chief executive officer, us as the executive branch, to find out Congress won't let us do that. I can give you lots of examples. You may have seen, um, and if you, if you were watching this on C-SPAN, you need something better to do with your time. Um, <laughs> we had a cabinet meeting where the president asked me to sort of um, go over some government restructuring ideas. Okay? And one of the ideas was we wanted to restructure um, the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, you talk to any uh, private folks in the infrastructure business, st states, counties, towns, and they'll tell you that the Army Corps of Engineers, when it deals with its civil works, I'm not talking about what it does militarily, I'm talking about the civil work stuff, is one of the greatest impediments to getting infrastructure built on time and on budget in this country. So we come up with this idea to take little pieces of, 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 of Army Corps, and if it was uh, environmental, dealing with wetlands and stuff, we're going to move that over to the EPA or Interior, uh, and if it was uh, approval of roads and bridges, deep water ports, that kind of stuff, we're going to move it over to DOT because that's what they do, right? It was a reasonable idea. It was a sound idea. It was based on good information, good work, and it was an executive execution. This is, the, this is the part of the running of the government. It's what we're supposed to do. Congress doesn't let us do it. Congress slipped one line into an appropriations bill. It says, the administration shall spend no taxpayer dollars, no, no, shall not be allowed to appropriate any funds for doing what I just talked about. 
tying our hands to actually run the government. I can't tell you how hard it is to fire uh, a, a, a federal employee. Uh, in fact, it, it came up one time at, uh, at one of my positions, I called up the lawyers and I said, look, this person just did this. Um, I, I need to talk about firing this person. They laughed at me. The, gov the, the, the career staff laughed at me when I raised the possibility of firing somebody for malfeasance. It's nearly impossible for the executive to be the executive. And until we get that fixed, take away some of our regulatory authority, but please, please, please give us the power to be the executive, which is what people uh, elect the president to do, and things might actually get a lot better. Um, lastly, I promised I'd talk about the uh, economy because I just love it, uh, and it's going so well, speaking of things that are getting better. Um, we continue to think it's going to be very solid. Um, first of all, a, a lot of the naysayers said we couldn't get to 3% growth. They were wrong. Now they're saying we can't stay there. We still think they're wrong. We continue to see data um, that reaffirms for us that this is a structural change. This is not a sugar high. It's not a stimulus. We have fundamentally changed the nature of investment, capital, um, taxation, business in this country, and we see it in the data. What's, what's one data point that I see? And I know Republicans talk too much about numbers, but this is one number that I think it speaks well more than just um, figures and dollars and cents, which is the quit rate. It's a, a something that we track. Uh, everybody follows the unemployment rate. Everybody follows the uh, you know, new hiring and firings, job creation. You know and how many people lose their jobs every single month or quarter month. Um, we also see, it's available to you, but no one looks at it, the quit rate, which is people who are separated from their job by their own will. They quit. Okay? They quit to go do something better. They quit to move to another town to take a better job. They quit to move to a competitor to get another job. They move to start their own business. That rate is at historic highs under Donald Trump. And I think that speaks of a confidence that people have not only in themselves, which has always been there, but it's a confidence in this country, a confidence in this government, and a confidence, uh, a confidence in this economy that frees them up to take those kinds of chances. That's a dynamism that we've been missing for far too long. Um, and we think uh, at many, many levels it's, it can continue. Um, my favorite uh, line about our efforts to fix the economy comes from Paul Krugman. And sooner or later, I think they're gonna realize that you can be wrong enough to where they take away your Nobel Prize. Um, <laughs> because he was one of the ones who said we couldn't get through. In fact, he was famously for saying on the day of the election that the markets were crashing and they were never going to come back. We were going to be in permanent recession. Then he said we could never get to 3%. You'd never get productivity up, which we did. Um, and uh, my favorite line from him is that, uh, uh, and this is a quotation from him. I'll get it a little bit wrong, but this is, this is close enough. He said, you could make me complete dictator of the country, and I could do everything I know to do, and I could only get your GDP up a couple tenths of a point. I believe that to be a true statement, by the way. Uh, but luckily, he's not the dictator of the country. Donald Trump is president, and we're better off for it. So anyway, thanks for having me. Uh, look forward to having a chat. We're going to take questions. If folks could line up at the microphones, uh, we're going to start with a lightning round of questions. If you could make your questions as brief as possible, identify yourself, and we'll alternate back and forth between the microphones. Go right ahead, sir. Yeah. Um, you spoke a lot about reducing re regulations. This has been an objective for many years. Yes, sir. My question is, are you simply trying, you, the appearance is created that the objective is to reduce the number of regulations without looking to the bigger picture. Are we making the government more efficient or are we just reducing the number of regulations? Um, I worked for OMB a few years ago for Niscanon. They have a, about 15 PhDs at that time in evaluation who reviewed the government for the purposes of reducing regulations and making the government more efficient. So what's the ultimate goal? Making the government more efficient, whether we cut two per one or do we cut regulations? Yeah, I, 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 I don't think I'm gonna dodge your question, but I think I'm gonna give you an answer you may not, uh, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, a, a really efficient government would be better at deregulating, right? Um, so uh, the two things do go hand in hand, but I would think that if we put the deregulatory uh, efforts in one category, you can put the efficiency arguments in the other category. The example I just gave of the Army Corps of Engineers, an efficiency argument, doesn't deal with deregulating. Uh, the other example I give, and I'm not making this one up, and I always get it wrong, um, let's see, if you, have a, if you make cheese, frozen cheese pizzas in this country are regulated by the FDA, but as soon as you put a pepperoni on it, it's governed by the USDA. Um, if you have a chicken 
and again, I get these backwards, the egg is governed by the USDA, it's born into a chicken, it becomes the USDA, you kill it and it's a piece of meat, it's back to the FDA, or it goes back and forth for several times. Um, that's inefficient. It's, uh, the word I use is stupid. Um, so <laughs> we're trying to fix that, but we can do both. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. At the end, if Congress will let us do these things, they won't let us fix any of those, by the way. There's other limitations in our spending bills that won't let us do those, just like there are for the Army Corps of Engineers. But we'd be better at regulating and better at deregulating. So the two actually do go hand in hand. Thank you. Let's go to this side. Hi, I'm Bradford Frisbee with the National Lime Association. Our members make chemical lime. Yeah. Uh, I know that uh, you guys have done a great job in deregulating uh, all the agencies, and OMB has a lot of powers to oversee that. But one thing that I think often gets overlooked is the Paperwork Reduction Act and the fact that every regulation, or many of them at least, uh, have a large component of information collection that's a part of it. Uh, have you talked to your staff at all about using that authority a little bit more vigorously at OMB to try to make sure that agencies are collecting information that makes sense from the public. Yeah, actually, it's probably one of our primary tools. So it doesn't get a lot of attention. Um, and people say, well, Paper Reduction Act, so it's just designed to reduce paper. It actually does a lot more than that. Uh, we're going through a, a major analysis right now. It, but the, uh, real short version, uh, you want to put out a reg, uh, we make a determination if it has a certain impact, and if it does, then you, it falls in sort of a different category, you have to do cost-benefit analysis. Uh, the Paperwork Reduction Act plays into that regime, and we use it every single day. So while you don't hear much about it, it is one of our primary sort of uh, authoritative uh, pieces of legislation that we do use. Um, you can use it as a weapon, you can use it as a tool, um, but we use it every single day. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name is Nick Lesis, and I wanted to ask you what you think about congressional notifications and how it hands, uh, ties the hands of uh, the executive agencies. Uh, I'm very familiar with USAID, and before we could do any major procurement, we would have to notify Congress, hey, we're about to spend this money that you already gave us to do such and such a thing. And then we'd have to wait two weeks, we'd have to you know, report when did the, you know, the notification clear. But it seems to me that it's not proper in terms of the constitutional architecture. Yeah, um, you know, we deal with it. You're absolutely right. If you didn't understand the question, is that there, we, we, it's not like they just send us the money and then we get to go, you know, go out and buy airplanes and then we get to go and buy airplanes. We have to tell Congress at different steps along the way, and it's absolutely inefficient. It just is. It's another chance for them to sort of pretend to be president, right? Which is what they do. It, it, the power of the purse is extraordinarily powerful, and it's supposed to be, right? That's, I mean, the, the founders put it in Article One for the right reasons. Um, but again, it's not designed, it's, I don't think it's intended um, to, to be a constant impediment to the functions, the proper functions of, uh, of Article Two. So um, yeah, we do deal with it. Um, my bigger, there's actually a couple things we actually have to get their approval on. Uh, not only do we have to notify them, we have to get their approval. That becomes even more troublesome, but we deal with those, those types. It's a great example of the overreach from the legislature. Last question. Yeah. Uh, ben Taylor from Arlington, Virginia. What are three things the federal government does well? Um, yeah, we, we, we kill things and blow things up. Um, we do, and that's, I mean, the military will tell you. That that's what we pay them to do, and they're damn good at it. And you have to have people who are really, really good at it. Um, and are extraordinarily proud of the, what the military does, and they are excellent at what they do. Um, we are, let me see, what else? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I count that as two. Yeah, that gives me one, one, one left. Um, generally speaking, generally speaking, we are good at bureaucracy, and I know that sounds wrong. Okay, but I'm going to let me explain that for just a second, see if I can convince you of it. Uh, I have now run three agencies. I've run the Office of Management and Budget. I've run the uh, what I used to call the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection. That name didn't stick. That's fine. And uh, now I run the Executive Office of the President. Um, and what I can tell you is that 99% of the people who work for you in the bureaucracy are really good bureaucrats. How do I define that? I define that as working as hard for the last administration as they do for this administration as they will for the next administration. And they understand how transition, they are to transition from one to the other. The story I told about OMB, some of the people who helped me deregulate and really threw their lives and souls into it were the folks who were helping Obama regulate on the way out the door. They're really, we do bureaucracy really well on a large scale. The, one, the problem is that other 1%, um, the folks who really are deep state, who are taking advantage of their position to try and, and frustrate the agendas of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an elected official that they don't like. That's the one you hear about, mostly, and rightly so, 
um, because they're effectively trying to undo the, the impact of, of an election. Um, I try to convince all the people that work for me that no, if you, if you want to be a good bureaucrat, I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, I just need you to leave that at the door when you come in. And 99 times out of 100, that happens. So we do that um, extraordinarily well. I'll take that as how about two out of three. So I think I got time for one more. Always take the lady with the hat, right? Thank you. Good morning. My name is Batia Zara. I'm a comparative intellectual property lawyer. Um, this morning's panel, right before you spoke, um, spoke a lot about the effect of deregulation uh, transferring some rights more back to, the, to states. And I'm curious about the uh, administration's position with respect to deregulation and whether or not that will um, indicate an increase in states' rights. Yeah, um, the question regards um, devolving authority back to the states, um, something that we have taken up uh, on many, many occasions. Uh, the three I'll bring to your attention are health care. Um, we, were, we were looking for ways to get the states more involved, have more skin in the game. Keep in mind, what's the, one, what's the big difference? I've been in state government. The big difference between state government and the federal government is that the federal government has a printing press and the states don't. So if you put the states in charge of more of it, they actually will have some type of motive to, to, to balance a budget. That motive, they have to do it. So there's that fiscal responsibility that we sort of lack. So we looked at that on health care. Education, the president has been very, very straightforward about the fact that he wants education to be run more by the states, not just for the fiscal reasons, but for the administrative reasons. I've never understood, when I was in Congress, I used to have people come in all the time and they'd say, I want you to vote this way on, on education. I'm like, where are you all from? They said, we're from Idaho. And I'm like, why do you think I, why would you ever care what I think about what you do with your schools in Idaho? And really what they're doing is they're looking at, at, at the federal level of government as a court of appeals because their state and local government didn't know what, didn't do what they wanted to do, so they try and get somebody else to overrule them. And that's where the system um, completely breaks down. So we've looked at it in healthcare, we've looked at it at, um, in education, we're looking at it right now in infrastructure. Keep in mind, most of the infrastructure in this country is built by non-federal entities, most of the state and local governments. Most of the federal, uh, of the infrastructure in this country is owned uh, by the state and local governments. Uh, do we have a role to play? Absolutely. Do we have a leadership role to play? Yes, we do. Are we oftentimes the biggest problem in getting stuff built? Absolutely that we are. Just go ask your county and town managers about repaving a road and what they have to do to satisfy the federal government. Um, so we have a role there, but we do think to drive efficiencies there, there's more opportunities for the states to get involved, and we'll continue to talk about that as part of our infrastructure approval. Thank you all very much for having me. I uh, hope you enjoy the day. I'm going to a cabinet meeting.